conferencia titulada Torre de Bitcoin Core, que como sabedes, ven porque fue muy salientada en los medios. Eh, eh, con este trabajo obtu obtuvieron este grupo do, do Politécnico de Zurich León de Oro en la Bienal de Venecia de 2012. Um, welcome, welcome to, to our school. Thank you. We're very proud and very happy to, to have you here. And, um, the, these questions about uh, uh, habitat um, in our schools are really new in our and in, in, in another schools from the modern dream of the of fair world to the postmodern nightmare of indifference now we are rescuing or try to rescue uh, the situation we was part of the problem the architects i mean and now we want to be part of the solution um, tiene la palabra tenga palabra eh, Jesús, jefe de oficina de, de cooperación. Buenas tardes. Es un placer para mí presentar esta primera jornada de Urban, estar en la mesa de presentación de Urban Tintán, educar, investigar y e actuar en no el desarrollo de las escuelas de arquitectura del proyecto Hábitat. El encuentro está financiado por la convocatoria de educación para el desarrollo, está financiado por la nuestra oficina de cooperación y voluntariado. Este año, precisamente en el 2014, tuvo a su primera edición, esperemos que no sea la última, e que busca pues, apoyar actividades como esta que, a que nos trae aquí, e que son desarrolladas por la comunidad universitaria, como una muestra más de la importancia de trabajar desde la universidad por la construcción de ciudadanía global una loita contra la pobreza e injusticia social. Un dos principales objetivos de la Oficina de Cooperación y Voluntariado es apoyar, eh, dar de pulo los valores de solidaridad, sensibilizar a la propia comunidad universitaria y e a la sociedad en general. Sobre los desasustes producidos por un sistema injusto que genera pobreza y e desigualdades, así esta educación por desenvolvimiento es a clave para que la universidad, como asente de cooperación por desenvolvimiento, eh, por, por lo que vemos una obliga de sumarnos a importancia y apoyar iniciativas como bueno, la llamada de, de Plácido Lizancos. ¿no? E una muestra más también de importancia de la multidisciplinaridad de cuando estamos a hablar de desarrollo humano sostenible y e de importancia de la arquitectura en este año. Bueno, sin más preámbulos, pues, damos paso. Sí, Plácido, tengo unas palabras también. Uh, just just uh, a few things. Uh because we are expecting Scott to, to talk, not Placid to talk. Just to say that the uh, project of the Habitat is a project, a wide project that has been running for a year and is expected to run for another year not right now. We have been, uh, we have received money from Junta de Galicia and also from the university. And we are working all together This is a joint venture between a group of professors of this school with architects, architects without boundaries uh, sit here. We are uh, proud of this project. We thank uh, university. We thank, of course, the, this architectural school to make this possible. And of course, we thank very much Scott Joy for being here and of course for doing this research that he is going to share with us. Why did we develop Project The, the Habitat? Well, as uh, Che Guevara say, we did this project because as much we know, much more responsive, responsible we are. Okay, thank you. Scott, you are welcome. Thank you very much. Feel okay. at home. <laughs> um, Well, um, firstly, maybe get straight to the title. It's called Tor David because it's the name of, of the tower or the, the official name given to the tower by, by the, the people who live there and the, the press and, and everybody who, who focuses on the tower. But Encore uh, it just gave this title because um, we are receiving a lot of um, inquiries from the, from the press, from our architecture colleagues, um, from other disciplines asking us 
uh, what our position is on the tower. So it's um, it's something that we always explain. Um, it's a research project which is trying to teach us what the limits of architecture is. So it's um, it's it's encore because there is a demand for this type of information. There's a demand for understanding how people adapt um, city environments to their own needs, and it's an increasingly um, prevalent theme in, in the global city. So the story of Torre David is, is one of a 45 floor tower, like sitting in the middle of a, of a global city, or once global city being Caracas. <laughs> and it was empty for the first 17 years of its life. So we're looking at a story of a tower, which has no facade. You can see it has one now, but there was no facade. There was no heating, no water no electricity and no facade so well no um yeah no facade. so uh and 45 floors high so it's also a story of 3,000 residents and about 750 families who made this uh abandoned building their home so for us and for any architect would argue it's a it's an intriguing case the Urban Think Tank team started the research in about 2009, like looking into um, what was this phenomena happening in the middle of this city and um, discovered not only how the building was being reused, but we like to think of this as sort of a, of a, a legacy of resilience. And um, we also found that the story ends up being quite a catalyst in the sense that the type of reactions we're getting, I mean, especially right now and especially after the Venice Biennale, um, uh, from our architect colleagues and from other people interested in, in the um, uh, focus on the tower, is either polarized between those saying, well, you can't exploit this type of um, situation. You, you can't go into a, a situation like this and start to um, project your own um, inquiry onto this. This is something which happens organically and leave it as it is and those saying well if architects don't do that then who does um, and we of course um, encourage this type of debate and encourage this, these types of um, essay uh, exchanges so um but between all the back and forward and all the conversations and all the static we do hear a very clear signal that people want to know more about what's happening there and um their, that desire for more knowledge and more information about how do how is there a need for living in under these conditions? Um, that's something which we take up readily and uh, we continue um, influencing our practice. So um, tonight um, I will show the trailer of the film that we've put together. We usually show this at the, at the film festivals. So it's a 20 minute um, documentary trailer looking at the, um, the whole tower or at least our research in the tower. So it's a Spanish premiere of the film trailer. Um, we'll play it then um, afterwards would be great to open the floor for discussions in the diagram and um, mapping formats that we put together. And um, yeah, we can continue from there. So just excuse the... Yeah. 
Este es el mundo de la necesidad de los que no tenemos una vivienda. No tenemos donde vivir, no tenemos que ir. No, yo creo que tenemos una oportunidad, de, aparte de una tragedia, ¿verdad? Creo, vengo para acá porque el agua se me llevó todo. Venimos para acá con un propósito de tener algo propio. Estamos luchando poco a poco para ver qué, qué resultado nos da el tiempo. O sea, todo con esfuerzo, que todo es un esfuerzo. Aquí todo es un esfuerzo. Gracias a todo aquí, todo es un esfuerzo para cada quien. Yo hice esfuerzo para tener mi, pues, mi, mi espacio, o sea, todo, ganar mi cara planta, cargar agua con mi pozo, eso era diario, tres, cuatro veces al día, bajar a buscar agua, subirla, todo, todo es un esfuerzo muy grande que se trata, poder tener que tener un movimiento. Yo fui ser del vecino. Permiso, imperativo, inteligente, travieso, mala cabeza, bolseador, pombero, más que bolita, de casi sin camisa, va a jugar al padre esquina, no comiendo cola, robando mano en la zona, tomando chancola con la llave de fijo y de goma, los ventiladores rusos, en el escuadro no se llena, a un respuesta mi gente lo que son abuela, aquella pozo de total, aquella condena, el soso que me prestaba la pena, que yo saliera, en la esquina toda la noche ponce con la crema de oro, mi primera bicicleta, Donde vivíamos alquilados. 
Entonces lo fuimos buscando, fuimos buscando, fuimos subiendo, buscando los pisos, los pisos, no, no tenía luz, porque cada quien que iba subiendo iba trayendo su rollo de luz, su pala, su, su saco y todo para ir limpiando los espacios donde íbamos a ocupar. Entonces sacaban los escombros, los botábamos, pintábamos, poníamos la luz y subíamos la pala. sentir lo único en su vida, lo más importante, la modelo preferida de la alfombra de su corazón, su más grande canción y en el amor la principiante, puso un anillo en tu dedo, suave en su colchón, quiso sentir la más inteligente, la más decente, te garantizó de ella por siempre, quiso mirar al frente sin miedo a la gente, es una mujer segura, grande, fuerte, llena de esperanza, pero... Y ya estaban puestas y todo. 
Ahí también hicieron, así como yo, hicieron el espacio. Pero aquí no había nada, aquí estaba esto. De aquel lado se habían, yo me imagino que aquí era para los ascensores también, o no sé. Las tuberías acá están, yo también me imagino que son de agua, que de electricidad. conseguir pues, la forma de construir y pues venirme para acá porque yo era conseguir de un edificio y no tenía donde vivir. Entonces, por eso duré dos años de conseguir, entonces cuando construí aquí me vine para acá. ¿Y de dónde vino usted originalmente? Yo soy de Colombia. De Colombia. Yo soy de Colombia, Barranquilla, pero tengo ya años de cada Cuenta, cuenta. Sí. Cuenta un poco. Tengo puntos de niña, baratas de mujer, eh, bolsas de regalo, flores, espaldas, eh, panty de niña. Medias de caballeros, medias de niños, de, de, de todo un poquito. ¿Son manteles o qué son? Estas son cajas de baño. Esta tira, esta pieza, y después no me voy. Y después sí, me voy. Esta pieza y esta pieza. ¿Y usted también ayuda? Que se ya conmigo. Qué bueno, que saben hacer cosas, que son productivos. Increíble. ¿Y le va bien con el negocio? No, porque le trabajamos a tercera persona. Ah, le entrega a tercera. Sí, sí, esto es, esto es directamente mío. Uh -huh. Esta pieza me la pagan a un precio con una parte. Y entonces, bueno, no es mucho. nos llaman a nosotros invasores, tenemos necesidades, es grande y fuerte, eh, gracias a Dios aquí estas personas aquí se han, se han organizado un poco más, si han hablado muy mal del edificio, no lo vamos a negar, muy mal, se expresan de que no va, si de un comienzo sí se veía eso, pero yo creo que ahorita hay más organización, hay más seguridad, vemos que que la persona que el presidente, su presidente, no creo decir nombre, porque para, para no mentir eso, ellos han organizado y él han dado frente a esto. ¿Qué te puedo decir? En un barrio todos vivimos a la deriva, pues, a que no te tienen que defender. Aquí hay un, tenemos un mecanismo parental, no que entra todo el mundo por la puerta principal, porque todos tenemos sus respectivas llaves mecánicas, y en el otro portón del estacionamiento hay otro portero y cosas así. En cambio, en un barrio, ¿quién te responde? Nadie te responde, nadie va a sacar el lechón de la esquina porque esa es su casa. Aquí no, aquí hay una organización en la que te ponen un... No te sacan así porque te van a sacar, ¿no? Le ponen un límite y si no, bueno, lamentablemente se tiene que ir 
porque no, no, está, no tiene necesidad, pues siguen su vandalismo y aquí lo que no quieren es eso, el vandalismo. Si alguien me va a preguntar, ¿dónde vive usted? En la Torre de Confianza, con demasiado orgulloso me siento de estar viviendo acá. Sí, la, gente, la gente conoce en eso. La Torre de Confianza yo le decía, ¡ah! Y la vives de ahí. Y se sí, han sí. hecho. Sí, lo hice. No, tú estás loco, acá la verdad. Yo sigo ahí. Y con mucho orgullo lo digo, vivo ahí. Todo el mundo vive tranquilo aquí. Para su cosa, para darnos el agua, para darnos la luz. Con todo el mismo condominio, ellos se encargan con la directiva, se encargan de hacer todo eso. ¿sí? O sea, que yo le pasé una carta por el intermedio comandante, ¿no? Y después, cuando llegó el Pero no puedes mentir a todos los que lleva el coco, pero muertos. 
Tomar los ojos de Cristo. No confundan la humildad con la ausencia, mamá. Como se puede regresar a Cristo. Y tú sabes que no estoy hablando del fuego. En caso de verlo, no. 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 Two months ago, on the 22nd of July, the the uh, tower was uh, evicted by the National Guard. They started from the top of the tower, moved down through the tower, and uh, evicted the inhabitants, the uh, 3,000 residents. So um, you can see in the film that the inhabitants actually did presume a uh, permanent habitat there. They had the impression that they were building something for their, um, their future. And um, this could have happened generally because of the climate of um, occupation of such um, buildings in, in Caracas at the time. Um, also referring back to the constitution and uh, different presidential decrees over the last six, uh, 12 years, including article number 82, which says, Every person has the right to adequate, safe, comfortable, and hygienic housing with essential basic services. Uh, so in the constitution, this actually states this. And um, secondary, um, it is the shared responsibility of the citizens and the state in all areas. So it's quite a strong uh, article to have in a constitution and the actions of the government in many different forms were supporting that. So it's actually the environment for squatting a building was um, very advantageous. But despite this, the families were moved from Torre David in the corner to a new home, 68 kilometers south of the city. And um, that was the relocation. So. Part of the study was to look exactly what it means to be living in the city in Caracas today and or in the last um, 12 years. And we see here a map of Caracas looking at the informal settlements, um, the invader or, or occupied buildings in the red dots, including Torre David, the, the largest dot in the corner. So 40% of the population there live in some sort of informal um, um, occupancy, informal state. So it's um, quite clear that the government didn't have perhaps a, um, a very clear position on its on its occupancy laws or or even that of, of private property. Um, there's no real clear reason why the government evicted the residents now or in this time. There's rumors that there was a, a Chinese investor or in the building was going to be demolished. There'll be a park in, this, in the place. Um, but that's not not um, not clear. But um, the government was definitely under some internal and external pressure to clear up the situation. Just zooming in a little bit to the center, we see in red the other um, buildings in the city which are occupied. So it's not a it's not a one-off case. You can see there's a hundred well, there's 155 buildings, either the government buildings, apartment buildings, um, private buildings, which are have been occupied at least. Um, uh, by 2011, this, this data was collected. Torre David is in the middle there. And looking at the tower itself, we see the tower is the bottom corner there, but actually it's a complex of three or four towers. With three towers, a elevator shaft in the center, and to the top there you see the, um, the car park, um, which acts as the transportation for those wanting to get up to the to the 10th floor. You saw the the woman riding on the back of the motorbike who paid the, the chauffeur to get her at least to the 10th floor. So the research took on um, primarily um, looking at the occupancy patterns, like what do people do in such a, uh, a monolithic um, empty space like this? And um, 
we went through, the team went through every single um, floor to look at um, what kind of um, behavior, what kind of practices were, were playing out on this, on this social space. You can see here, there's a, there's a split of, of um, private apartments here. There's light industry, there's administration, religious, um, for relig religious purposes. And in the section, you can also see that firstly the car park on the right hand side there and on floor 28 that was the upper limit no one no one was occupying below or uh, above floor number 28 this seemed to be from the organizing committee the the stop for the occupation just for organization and and walking up 28 floors is they realize it's just not really that uh that comfortable so 28 seemed to be the cap in the middle there in blue you can see um what is represented as the water system. So the residents had water and electricity, which they installed themselves. And this is pretty much how they did it. You can see in the center, the water system photograph, the uh, walls were built on the 16th floor. Water was tapped from the mains underneath the building and pumped up to the 16th floor and then distributed from that point there. So it's, um, there's a lot of labor, a lot of planning, um, a lot of organization, um, which goes into such a system like that. And uh, even a lot of knowledge of how that whole um, type of system works. On the right side, you see the electricity. So on the diagram, it's quite clearly a professional job of some sort. I mean, all floors are linked to a, to a central spire, the grid, which was tapped into through, throughout the whole building. And it's even then metered at certain areas. So people know exactly how much energy they're using. And as you noted in the film, one of the um, residents says they pay for all the electricity and water, right? So this, they, they connect it to the, to the grid. They take the resources, water, electricity. Um, there was a moment when the organization said, right, let's try and um, legitimize, our, legitimize our occupation. We pay back all the electricity and water we've been using until this date, to that date of the organizer of the negotiation. And from then on, they were paying <coughs> typical rates like anybody in the, in the formal city. It was a negotiated a contract, but they were paying for electricity and water. And um, that was pretty much how the, the, um, the apartments in there became, as you can see, quite normal domestic apartments. Um, on the left here just shows also a split of the commercial um usages we have shops there um hairdressers um there were um uh, religious centers in the bottom and administration for the whole building also um, located down the bottom there in the in the building the research also took into account um how people were using the space this was very interesting for us to to gather as much data as we could on how people um, are using the, the, um, the space themselves, but also how they're creating the infrastructure, where are the peaks and the troughs of the infrastructure, and where can we actually, if it was our task to, to offer um, a, um, a solution which could advantage the, um, the residents in a very lo-fi way, then we would um, have to draw on this type of data. So, looking at surveying uh, the residents and monitoring the use of water, um, electricity, um, movement and mobility throughout the tower. We see certain uh, um, patterns which we can draw upon. The right and left is doing typical uh, site analysis, looking at um, wind and, and uh, solar aspect. So we took that type of data and, and went away and thought, well, if this tower or a tower like this would be a, a case study in which we would be asked to create some sort of um, um, uh, refit or, or plug-in, <coughs> would say perhaps we could look at the mobility, we could activate the top um, or the 28 floors above, or the, the floors above the 28th floor, I mean, we could put in perhaps some sort of a, an elevator system which runs uh, like a bus schedule. It stops at every fifth floor, perhaps, and it runs on a timetable. So we, we um, can lower maintenance and electricity costs and it'd be quite a simple and standard um, um, mobility offer which could activate the greater 
part of the building and also um, give a better quality of life for those who are remaining in the building. We also looked at different ways of creating um, energy to also be a little bit more autonomous on the electricity side. In this sense, the idea was to draw water from the mains, which was already in part of the negotiation. Um, drawing that water in off peak times, collecting it in areas in the building and then releasing it then at peak electricity times, having very simple lo fi um, electric generation, uh, hydroelectric generation um, mechanisms there to. Uh, to create uh, electricity and also to distribute the water around the building. So these ideas were more a reflection on what we found during the during the research, during the discussions. We'd ask people what their ambitions were, what wasn't working for them, what was what was working successfully, and then drawing upon that to create our own brief, and then coming back to um, to uh, share those ideas with the people there and also to um, to the broader um architectural world to see how um this adaptation could take on a more of a formal um approach because the formalization of that occupation was already happening by the people themselves so it's um you may have seen this book it's in it's in your library there's a spanish version coming out i think this year so um we'll have one sent to the, to the library once we get that more of the research is in there but it does uh, it is a small part of the book most of it was really about um finding out about what we can learn from such a situation like that how it affects also how we approach um situations which are alternatives to, to the general practice of what we understand as architecture um parallel with the venice biennale we took all the findings the photography the the surveys and, and the art back into the tower where we where we showed the whole research there and then we would say that um, the final uh, outputs were almost like a, um, a close off of our immediate um, findings in the project. Whatever this looks like or whatever form that takes um, for us is, is kind of secondary, but I think the project itself was propelled by a curiosity to say, well, we can wait for architecture to come to us or we can go and find out where architects can be most effective in, in completely different environments. That's generally um, the, the major learning from us. And it's also to say, um, how can we expose this alternative patterns of living and, and modes of living uh, to, the, to a greater audience, to governments or to the private sector, um, but also how that inspires our, our working process. So, you know, when you have uh, an idea in your head and you have been occupied with something so, um, vivid as a project like Torre de Vid, this idea stays in your mind and you start to see it everywhere. This is in Trinidad where we, we run a design semester. It's a car park um, on the right side and the left side it's been occupied and turned into a homeless shelter. So the same pattern applies there. We did a, a very quick uh, research of that but it led us to certain ideas to say well uh, as architects, if we look at a raw structure like this and we've done the calculations, we say we could actually save 70% of the building costs if we don't put in the electricity, the heating, the water and the elevators um, or a facade. And we say, well, is that an, an offer which if we can, we can put it in the right way and in the right context, it's, uh, it's another approach of, of um, filling a kind of a gap between what the government can provide for people and what the private sector can provide for people. Both these these um, columns don't actually provide for the informal um, need or the need for for low cost housing, as you can see in um, any uh, statistics. So the idea is that as researchers and designers, we we're looking at design research. We're looking at um, analyzing like practically how the real world works. And we look at that through different oppositional movements or different alternatives to how people are living. And we try and bring those two together. And that's where we, where we um, discover a new field of working. And that's uh, what we're teaching at, um, at our classes in the, um, at the ETH in Zurich. It's um, to find out that, that middle zone or that crossover where architects are absent. And I think they've kind of failed both the profession and also the public 
by not looking at that and not finding out where where they can be more effective. I have more information and documentation of the work of Urban Think Tank, but it's actually in another project I was going to present it tomorrow. Um, it's like a two minute, three minute film. Should I send it here, show it here? It's like a small trailer. Is it right? Perhaps you've seen this project. It's a it's a vertical gymnasium which was um, drawn from ideas where we saw an abandoned uh, space, which was a small football court, and there was a great demand for more sporting activities in um, this particular barrio. The idea was to develop the um, gymnasium as a kit of parts and put it together and offer that as a patent-free design, which is now being um, installed elsewhere. Uh, around the world. So most of these projects come about by sitting in on community meetings, finding out what people are missing or what the, what the demand is, um, coming from a grassroots level, finding out how that works within um, structures and budgets and political timetables in the, um, on the uh, government side, and then finding a way to make um, those um, desires meet. This cable car system connects the, the hillsides of, of Caracas, the, the barrios, which were not connected to the formal um, transportation network, and it brings them together into one, one loop. So in that way, brings the two cities or two uh, um, parts of the city together. That's a very, very short uh, trailer, but there's more information on the, on the websites. That's, that's it. That's it. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Should we have a, a debate right now? Okay. So if there is a question, I think it's it's not this whole thing to be up with you all. I remember you that tomorrow we are going to have a second lecture that is going to be held. I'm not sure I think the Room 2.4. No, 2.1. 2.1 says, where is this? This is going to start at half past 12. Okay. Later on, it's a, a second opportunity to, to, to talk with Scott. Some questions, a lot of questions, I think. Yeah. But uh, no, nobody wants to, do, to talk. I can translate it if you need me. <laughs> Somewhere. Okay, they are quite shy. <laughs> well, yes? Is that the question you just had? Okay, don't worry. Is this a question that's going to be on the council? Or are you looking at that? Or are you going to be on the question? No, 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 it's real. 
it's real. The vertical gymnasium is uh, already running, yeah? The vertical gymnasium, yes, it's, it's been built. There is one sample being built. There's a second one, I think, being built at the moment. There's a potential to have one um, one now in um, Jordan. There was a, the latest um, Haiti. There was a there was talk of having one there. It's a system which can be bought. I think it's the the first cost was about a million U.S. dollars. It's not a I mean, it's not expensive really. It's um, it's for a community which understand the value of keeping um, the youth off the streets and into kind of like sports um, clubs. The um, the vertical gymnasium that you saw there, we we um, did a survey of what the effect of the gymnasium was in that particular barrio, and the the crime rate reduced thirty percent over the time of um, after building the, the vertical gym. So you can see there's a there are people want to have their kids not running around in in gangs. They would rather have them in a in a vertical gym of, of this sorts. And so there's negotiation of making more vertical gyms and. Um, that's a constant uh, um, uh, prototype, which will be then um, developed whenever there's a need or, or, or location for it. It's a system which can be adapted and changed depending on what program the, the owner want to, wants to have it. So one is being done, as I said, one is being uh, constructed and there's, there's plans for four others in, in different parts of the, of the world. Okay, more questions? Okay. I have one question. Only one. You say that the architects, we, the architect, uh, can help the world to be a best place. Where do we learn how to manage this situation? Where did you learn to do this work? Um, this is a lot of uh, a lot of um, knowledge. Um, um, building up a lot of knowledge by working directly in the field. Um, Hubert and Alfredo started the urban think tank as an NGO. They're working pretty much as a, as a not-for-profit and working on smaller scale projects in, in the um, barrios. This moved into the, a university, um, also in a private business, and now it's drawing on the resources and, um, and knowledge of the university system. So starting pretty much with the knowledge from the communities, from the people, um, working up systems through a scientific uh, way, like through on a university level, working up um, through analyzing and, and then uh, testing and, and then going back to the community. And that is a, a constant process of, of developing uh, um, a knowledge. But I think um, you have to just do. I think you have to. Action is actually the, the only way to, to learn, really. And do lots of mistakes as well. I think there's, but I didn't talk about those today. But. But do you, do you prefer to, to work <coughs> with these people direct, directly with people or to work with uh, industrial producers, producers of housing? Do you prefer the work much closer mm -hmm. with the people? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. I think the um, more of the analyzing work is dealing has to happen on a on a level where we're finding out new ways of, of, of living, how people are living in, in different conditions. But we believe that the housing, different housing crises are not going to be solved by um, just social housing uh, or just one type of housing offer. So we say that um, uh, working, for example, in Cape Town, the government do have a social housing policy, but that's not going to be enough. And uh, the government cannot keep up with the demand so it's going to have to happen on a different level, which is on an informal level. So that's a, there, there are many different variations of housing to, to work on. And I don't have a preference, actually. I think it's, it's more on the, the constellation of the project, which is interesting. If the community is organized and they can um, express their ideas and their, and their will, and if you're working with NGOs who are sincere and who have a good connection with government and the government want you to be there then that's a good project no matter if you're working on social housing or the informal sector so i think it's okay uh, last question uh, what about the re uh, relationship in between the the architects and the people the common people uh, did it work we are usually here in the formal world we are uh, quite annoyed that there is a shocking relation in between architects and, and people what about uh, Torre David? 
uh, I mean, toward the vid, the, so yeah. I think the in this case there was there was an interaction which the, the people welcomed um, the uh, the investigation because they wanted greater visibility. They wanted to show the world that they weren't freaks in a tower. They were actually real people working on the on um, making a, a habitat. But um, when we propose um, what we think we could do for them that was probably a secondary part of the project which I, I don't think was um the primary focus of the project in this case but on other issues uh, working for example in cape town we do have a very strong connection with the community and the ngo and we are working on designs to, um, <coughs> they need our knowledge for the construction and how to arrange to rebuild their cities but um it's a very much of a of a conversation we're having with them. Uh, any other question? Yes. yes. I have a question. I mean, the projects in Caracas and Sao Paulo, do you have worked with local local architects or the design on the project is just a responsibility of the people? Most of the work was developed in Caracas um, with the their think tank office there. So those guys have, are from Caracas. So the urban think tank has a office in Caracas and in Zurich. So the the work on the field and the and the architecture drawings they come generally from the office in, in Caracas at the time. So now it's it's more when we're working also again in other fields. It's we have a local partner who is who is vital to actually make sure we have the direct connection with the governments and and other partners. So that's and that's in every project you do you need to have a strong local partner who is defending your interests, have their own interests, but you can meet each other on a, on a good level, but you can trust each other. But we couldn't do anything if we were just sitting in Zurich doing, doing drawings. No, no chance. No. Another question. Just got three little observations on three, three questions. Three. Yes, very little. This is the first time I, I noticed there were immigrants in the, in the occupation. Mm -hmm. I thought everybody was born in Venezuela, but not people coming from abroad. So what percentage of immigrants were in the... Um, I, I really don't know. Um, that would have been, there were questionnaires, which, which um, the team did, but I, I don't know those, those figures. Um, I, I know that generally the, the tower was occupied and there was a limit to the occupation. People who knew each other sort of came into the tower. It wasn't a complete mix from, from everywhere. It was definitely mm -hmm. through, um, I mean, actually the, the whole occupation took place with um, quite a sophisticated um, information delivery through, through SMS and through, um, through um, networks, which drew in a specific group of people who were in that kind of uh, in the know. I think it was, it was diverse in the end, but um, um, I can't, I don't know exactly how that, that split. And what about the relationship between the government and the occupation? Always, I mean, like uh, love and hatred. Yeah, I, I would, I would say so. At what point does the the government change their mind? This is also um, a question we we um, ask ourselves too. We don't know why exactly on this evening it was chosen to to um, vacate the building. I'm sure there's there there is a political uh, or geopolitical strategy towards it and i know it? sorry did you expect it or not um not really no not really uh, i think we it could have been one year it could have been five years it could have been but i think at the moment you know i mean if if Chavez was still there and he would and the, the situation was as it was when he was alive i think it could have extended far beyond what it is now i think because of the turmoil in the last um, six months, I think it's the, the situation was becoming um, such a state where he, um, the government needed to make a, a strong statement to say we do have um, the country under control. You know, it's um, but still, it's still very ambiguous, and there wasn't anything. There was no new information, which which suggested that there had to be a, an, an eviction. So some days ago, maybe fourteen days ago. Uh, the head of this uh, school of architecture in Caracas 
was there, uh -huh. where you are sitting uh -huh. now. Yeah. And he was more critical with the movement. Yeah. He talked about the background of the, of the the person in charge, because people in the video talk about the organization. Mm -hmm. What about the organization? It was not a public organization, obviously. Nothing to do with the, with the it's government. It's formal, the, informal. Yes. Formal yes, or formality. But the director, the, the head of the school, was very critical with the background of the person in charge. Mm -hmm. He was coming from prison, I think. Uh, he had connections with a, with a religious mm, mm -hmm. movement. Mm. Uh, what about it? Yeah, I think informal doesn't mean unorganized, but in the sense where this particular character was, was, um, was running the... Uh, or at least um, facilitating the management of the building. I don't know about his character in, in specifically, but I would also uh, be skeptical of any, any leader who rises to certain uh, uh, prominent positions. He's not always the, the a saint in any way. I think there are certain figures in governments uh, which you would also question. And I think uh, looking at the character, I don't think is the right way to, to analyze the the 3,000 people who needed the house and needed to live in an organized um, situation. I think that they were organized was something of a credit to, to themselves and, and to a credit of, of how that whole um, thing became a habitat and not just a, not just a squat, you know? So um, there were, there was security at the gate there. The, they, it, was, it was said that there wasn't, there weren't dealers in the building, for example, they were very well organized in that sense. Um, I, but, yeah, there's always going to be individual characters who who actually then try um, uh, to take power wherever they can. And uh, but I don't think that's an indictment on the building or on the situation of the building. I'm not sure where that. Uh, the, the very last question: What's the meaning of join us? What's something that means? Are the gates of uh, ATH They're open. open for everybody? Yes, e even for me. Of course. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Shane. No, <laughs> but no. Write an email if you're interested in more information, or, or heading okay. by, or in Zurich, or or um, looking to to have some interesting work. So. Okay. Uh, uh, so we have some students working in this project. Yeah. Maybe they have some questions for you. So I encourage them to to ask. Maybe tomorrow to think about what you have listened and you have seen and to write the questions and we can uh, address questions to, to Scott tomorrow. You don't want to do it right now, maybe? Okay, think about it. Uh, tomorrow, Scott will be here much fresh than today because he has already arrived from Zurich this evening. Um, I think he must rest right now. <laughs> okay. The siesta. Tomorrow there is a second opportunity. The last. And the very <laughs> last. <laughs> I'll take last. advantage of it. The last by the moment. Well, the last. The last. If you jo don't join the <laughs> I hope <laughs> you don't join them. Okay. At half past 12 on the room 2.1. Uh, one. One. And we can share things with uh, Scott. There is a lot of things of ideas coming to us because now we are in both places and I think that no formal processes are going to be part of our next future in order to manage uh, such a lot of things we, we have around us, okay, here, in, right in Spain. Of course, he is going to talk uh, tomorrow about upgrading uh, Cape Town. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And more information about the projects and how we, we work on a project. That's, that's been... Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, pleasure. Thank you.